Um, I'm Julian, anyway, for the KISS FAQ Rick, podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, Rick, thanks for joining us today. Um, I want to talk to you about two bands. You were there at the beginning of both of these bands. And first of all, let's go back. It's the 50th anniversary of KISS this year. Mm-hmm. And in late 1972, I believe, you were on a fly on the wall of them rehearsing as a trio before Ace Frehley joined the band. That's a mind-blowing thing for you to have witnessed and for me to get to talk to someone who was there. Can you take us into the, those rehearsals and to what you saw and how it differed from what they became? Well, I got that. That became, well, I met Peter Chris after he got out of the band Chelsea. And his family moved around the corner from me in Brooklyn. Right. All right. So I wound up becoming friends with uh, the middle-aged daughter. It was Joanne. There was an older sister, Nancy, then Joanne. And then there was a younger sister, Donna, who my friend John Alton went out with. Right. So we would, Peter would stop by his mom's house in, in Brooklyn on the way into Manhattan to rehearse. with Kit. Wait, he, put, he put the famous ad out, drummer willing to do anything to make it. Right. Which Gene and Paul saw. And, and so he started rehearsing with them, and he... They became the, the trio that they became. And he would stop by and say, hey, you want to come and watch rehearsal? Sure. So we'd go up to, went to their loft, watch them rehearse. They had milk crates, you know, old milk cartons on the wall to absorb sound. It was just like it was described, paint peeling off the walls. Manhattan had a lot of buildings that had, were industrial lofts. Right. So this was, you know, gutted industrial loft. You know, it was maybe 30 feet by 10, 30 by 12. Right. So we sit at one end, they were rehearsed at the other. And the first thing I saw was Gene Simmons' SVT amp cabinet had the stencil Jack Bruce nice. on the side, which is one of Jack Bruce's cabinets from Cream, like that. And, and pretty much what we saw and, and heard them doing was the, the early initial uh, versions of what we heard on the first album. Right. You know, Strutter, uh, Firehouse, Nothing to Lose, like that, as a three-piece, without, without the solos. And, and they were rock stars at that point. I mean, you know, uh, g- jeans, platform shoes, you know, that's how we rock, rockers dressed back then, like that. And I try to imitate that as well. And, and we just watched them go through the, through the set, you know, or, or we'd move over, there was a little couch, we'd sit on that. And, and Gene was trying to get us to clap, you know, on, on parts where there was a clap, you know, to clap along, things like that. We had, there was no standard to match them up to. We, there was nobody to compare them to because they didn't sound like anybody. Right. They were heavy like Humble Pie. They had catchy, uh, I don't want to say Doobie Brothers, but, you know, uh, catchy songs. Right. You know, uh, really easy choruses, stuff that you, we could leave there and remember the songs. Right like that and then so they there was a period where they were auditioning guitar players and uh, uh, Bruce Kulik his brother Bob Kulik auditioned uh, a lot of people uh, JJ French from Twisted right. City a lot of people auditioned but when we went back up there Ace Frehley was there so right. he had gotten we missed it but he got the gig he was wearing a gray pinstripe suit with a purple sneaker and an orange sneaker and he's leaning against the wall he's got his leg up like this up against the wall and he's playing he's ripping leads he's like Chuck Berry on 12, right. kind of, you know, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page type, and Paul's nudging him, you know, get off the wall, get off the wall, come, you know, interact with us while we're playing, and it was just, and then, of course, my friend John would bring, like, a six-pack of Budweiser, and Ace would get, John, can I have one of your beers? Yeah. You know, and he'd finish that, with John, can I have another one of your beers? He drank all of John's beer, like that, and, and uh, but it was, it was like, we were... We were, I was still in high school. We were like, wow. Well, you're a Bishop Laughlin. You were writing about him in the Jameson, were you? I did, yeah. yeah. How, did you, how did you find out about that? Yeah, I read an article that you wrote in uh, December 73, and you were talking about the best glitter scene bands. And that you're was. running through Sniper, which was Joey Ramone, Joey fronted Ramone, yeah. them. Yeah. Um, I think you had Luger in there, Luger. ISIS, uh, Broadway, something. Turned down Broadway. Turned down Broadway. There were some bands I took pictures of at Coventry, yeah. Yeah. And Street Punk and, and Bratz and, yeah. So you were you were all around that scene, and it is, of course, your photographs that have been ripped off for decades. Thank you, yes. Um, and, you know, I've got some in my drawer that I bought in record stores in the 80s, you know. You, you took those photos, and people basically stole them and, and made money off them for you sharing. Yeah, what I did was I put together a Kiss scrapbook mm-hmm. with a leather belt and a strap on it. It's a Kiss and Glitter, Kiss logo. When I got to California, I, I met some diehard Kiss fans, and they said, "Hey, if you ever are interested in selling anything from your scrapbook, you know, take it off your hands." I needed some money, you know. I was I was uh, just out of wasp, and uh, I, I took some of the pictures. There. They're still mounted on cardboard, right. and I took them and I, I you know sold them to this guy. 
Little did I know in a million years he would take pictures of those pictures and start pirating them and selling them around the world. Right. And I would start to, when the internet was created, after a while I started to find my pictures on the internet with other people's watermarks on them. That must piss you off because you own the copyright to those photos. They remain your photos to this day. I still have day. the negatives. Yeah. If people remember what negatives are, I have the negatives. For them. And I have the negatives for Turn Down Broadway, for ISIS, the Bratz, for Harlots of 42nd Street. You know, bands that I saw so go, uh, went to see play at the Coventry. Right. Where, and I've got pictures of Kiss at the Coventry as well. You know, like that. And then, yeah, so my pictures were all around the world. And now when I get contacted, like uh, Destroyer Magazine, which is out of Sweden, yep, great, Swedish Kiss Army Group, they, they asked me, you know, can we, do we have permission? Can we use your photo? Yes, you can. They, you know, and I said, put a disclaimer in it, you know, like by Phil Maurice pictures of KISS, you know, from the, the press presentation. Uh, you have to put that those were my pictures, and if you see them anywhere, and my name is not on them, know that they were stolen. Right. Like that. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. No, it's important, because obviously, photos are worth a lot of money now. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And you've missed out on that money with them getting stolen, which, you know, is not a good thing. You know, what's interesting is, looking back now, decades, how many KISS conventions have there been? I've never been invited as a, as a featured guest speaker for what I bring to the table about my memories of KISS and being there. I've never been asked to be a featured guest speaker. I, we can't figure that one out. Why not? Because, I, it, again, when I saw that you're on this guest list, I'm like, Rick was there. I'm like, Rick has the stories. I mean, yeah, we're going to talk about Wasp in a minute as yeah. well. Yeah. Again, these beginnings that you were a part of is just so critically important. I want to ask you specifically about Paul Stanley as a trio. Was he not do, trying to do any lead work? Was he just continuing to do rhythm? Like, here's a space where we're going to have a lead guitarist? Or was he trying to fulfill the role as a single guitarist at all? It was mostly rhythm guitar. Right. But I think he would, he would play like... Uh, um, I don't want to say lesser leads, you know, just something simple, like the, like the harmony line or whatever, right. just, just to fill in the spot like that. But it was mostly rhythm guitar, you know, because without that rhythm guitar, you have just a bass and drums, and you have that other section of the rhythm section drop drop out a little bit. So he'd play a little bit of lead, but he did some mostly rhythm like that. And, <laughs> well, he had an attitude back then. Did he? I think he's got an attitude. Well, him and Gene both had attitudes. Well, what about Peter? Because on a lot of those early recordings that we hear, we hear him shouting. You know, he's doing a lot of interaction with the crowd. He's also picking apart the arrangements and saying, hey, we did this too fast, I screwed that up. Yeah. I mean, he's a very vocal guy. Yeah, well, you know, Peter's, Peter's like your, your typical Brooks, Brook, Brooklyn Mafia gangster guy right. on drums. Uh, like that. He, he didn't take crap from anybody, you know, and, and he'd call a spade a spade. Well, you, you play at the King's Lounge, I'll you're going to do it. it. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was, uh, you know, don't mess with me kind of guy. Right, like before that. we talk about Wasp, I, I just want to get your take on Kiss at the End of the Road. It looks like we're finally, finally creeping towards an ending. This year. Sorts. <laughs> this year. You know, 50 years nearly to the day of their professional debut, you know, and the, those final Coventry gigs. For someone who was there at the beginning, do you have any feelings on that? I'm glad to see them succeed in what they did. Uh, they, they took it, they, they raised the bar. You know, uh, we, we kind of knew back then they were going to be big, they were going to be somebody. We never knew to what level. Right. But, you know, it, it's kind of like, I have to use this as a, as a metaphor, but like, like a proud parent. You know, from watching them in the rehearsal off, and then hearing the demo. And I used to have a copy of the demo they did with Eddie Kramer. Right. With the, you know, because so, I tried to get them to play at my high school, and we got very close. But the, the people on the, on the committee that I had an answer to, they, we don't know who this band is, we don't know anything about them, so we're going to pass on it. Right. And Gene got mad. Not like, bad. well, don't be mad at me. I'm doing everything I can to help promote you guys. So then, when the when the finally uh, uh, their, their debut came on WNEWFM in, in New York, and we got to hear the album, the whole album on the air. You feel that sense of pride. Like, I was there. Right. I was watched him create that. So that, that you know, made us feel really, really good about that. And of course, then they go on the road, and then they put out the other, and then here comes Kiss Alive. You know, and then, bam. Everything just opened wide for them. Right. You know, and, and it was like, each year, each tour, something new, something new. I saw them at, the, at Madison Square Garden several times, Dynasty, and, and you know, several of the tours. Right down in the front row, you know, Peter would come out, and he would sing uh, 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 Beth. Right. Like that. And you know, to his family, his nickname was Georgie. Right. 
So, so I'd yell in the pro, you need charging. He'd see me down, he'd throw, throw me one of the roses like that, or the roadies would come out and give me a handful of guitar picks. Right. So that guy right there, give him some picks. With that. So it felt good to be, be recognized, be part of that. You know, then I had to step back and, and, and get involved in my own music career. Well, were you playing at that time, or did it inspire you? Where were you along musically yourself? My professional debut was 1975, October, at Max's Kansas City. Wow. With, with a band, I was, I was a year out of high school, and, uh, and I was with the Martian Rock Band. Right. And Max's was the legendary club in New York where the rock and punk scene was growing out of. Mm -hmm. So I was rubbing shoulders with the Ramones, Wayne County, Tough Darts, Richard Hell, uh, you know, uh, uh, The Fast. You know, and all the bands that I had seen when I was in high school, you know, or bands that would open for Kiss, you know, The Diplomat, right. like that. Now I'm hanging out with these guys, you know, which was killer. You know, uh, uh, a real quick uh, thing. I knew somebody that worked at the Palladium in New York, which was the Academy of Music. Yep. Became the Palladium. So I'd get in for shows for free all the time. Front row, heart. Uh, this, that, and the other, and I went to see Pat Travers with with uh, it was Pat Thrall, Pat Travers, uh, Tommy Aldridge, Mars Kelly. You know, it was the Boom Boom Out Goes the Lights right. tour that ever. And I'm in the front row, right? After the show, I got to go backstage. I got, took a picture with Pat Travers. We're hanging out. That's around, I want to say, 78, 78, 79, mm -hmm. right? Jump to 83. Steeler, my, my LA debut. Right. We're opening for Hughes Thrall. Right. Pat, 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 uh, Glenn Hughes, Pat Thrall. Yep. Pat Thrall. After the show, I said, I said, I don't know if you're gonna remember this. I said I was in the front row for you guys at the Palladium. He goes, I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> Like that. So I, said, I said, I have both of your Automatic Man albums, by the way. He goes, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so I had a bonding moment with Pat Thrall, which was like incredible. He remembered me, some kid in the front row. That's nice. And I said, now we're sharing, playing the same show. No, no so, that, that always feels good when that does happen. But you've taken us into L.A., which, you know, inevitably takes me into the Wasp story. Yeah. Because you were a part of Wasp with the very formation of that band. You're in the, the first official PR photos of it. You're on the first demo. You're a founding member of Wasp, no matter what history is written around that. Fact is fact. Yep, co-founder. Co-founder. Co well, yeah, you, you know, Wasp is celebrating, or has been celebrating, its 40th anniversary. As someone who was there at the beginning of that, and who did not have, maybe, the joy that you should have had from that experience, what are your feelings on Blackie? So being a survivor and being able to bring that show back on the road, do you have any feelings or do you want to say no comment? Uh, see, if, we, if they bring up my name to Blackie, he'll go next question. Right. No comment, next question. Uh, I'm glad to see he did what he did. You know, he's a unique uh, writer, creator, and all that. Not everything he does is original, but then in his business, what is? Uh, they were called Sister. Yep. And my number was uh, handed off to him from some kids who were visiting in New York at the time. And uh, uh, they gave him my phone number and a, and a picture I had. He called me up from L.A. He says, he talked me into coming to L.A. to try out for his band. Like that. And they, they flew me out. And I auditioned for the band. It took two days. Mm -hmm. You know, you know uh, the, the process. But sitting there watching the three-piece, now I'm back in the Kiss Loft. Right. And I'm watching... The three, Randy, Blackie, and Tony, go through the set, six, five songs. It's all right, come on up. I'm plugged in, and I, I played, you know, and, and so after two days, he said, all right, you got the gig. And about, you know, Blackie's car wasn't running really well back then. Mike Solon, who was the guy that picked us up at the airport, for your trivia people, Mike Solon is the bartender in the, in the, uh, uh, uh Fly to Texas video. All right. Okay. He goes, what he goes, what's a gig? Okay. And he pours the, the acid on the bar. Okay. That's Mike Solon. Mike Solon is Eddie Solon's brother from I Kiss. Was, I was going to ask Ace if Frehley's that was the connection. Guitar yeah, the sound man. So it, that says the connecting the dots. Uh, so Mike would drive us back and forth everywhere, you know, to rehearsal and whatnot. And uh, I had a I was staying at Blackie's cottage in Hollywood. Uh, we're now into like March, almost April. Uh, I, had, I, I got here February, February 4th of 82, 1982. So I'm now in the band, we're rehearsing, whatever we can get Mike to drive us down to rehearsal. I get a phone call from a friend in New York, I take Blackie's phone, and I go all the way out to the courtyard 
there was a, a giant avocado tree, leaves all over the courtyard. So I'm talking on the phone, I'm kicking over leaves, and I kicked over a leaf, and I saw it looked like a, like a, a yellow jacket, a hornet. Right. So I stepped on it real quick, so it wouldn't fly up and see. And then I ticked the leaf over, and it wasn't completely dead, it was still squirming. And the way it was squirming with the stinger moving like that, it reminded me of the old uh, the TV series that ran opposite of Batman. It was called Green Hornet. And it was curved the same way as the Hornet. <coughs> and I, I go back in the house. I said, do you remember... He's black, he's watching the Yankees game on TV. I said, do you remember how you were saying this is going to be a whole new band? We need a whole new gimmick, a whole new name? Everybody goes, yeah. And I said, I got an idea for a band name. He goes, what's that? I said, Wasp. I said, I just stepped on one outside in the courtyard. He said, remember the Green Hornet logo? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's thinking, he looks up at the ceiling and he goes, boss. Oh, I said, it's a good idea. He goes, keep thinking like that. The next night that we were at rehearsal, we did rehearsal, we got together afterwards. Blackie, me, Tony, Randy. Blackie goes, we have a new name for the band. Randy goes, well, I wanted to call a band Hellion because that's what they call bad kids in Texas. He said, there already is a band called Hellion up in Hollywood. And Tony goes, what's the band name? Black goes, Wasp. Tony goes, Wasp? The name's a band after a bug. And I said, the Beatles? Scorpions? <laughs> Black goes, that's it. That's the name of it. So right there, that makes that's the four co-founders of a new band, right. technically speaking. And then so Blackie called up Don Atkins, did some photos. Yep. Like that, and and he, Don says Blackie called me up. He's all excited. We got a bass player. We got a bass player. This is great, man. He sounds great. We got to do photos. So we did photos at Don Atkins' parents' house, and and uh, by the end of May, Blackie got some something up his butt. He stopped talking to me. He says we got to talk. You're out of the band. It's not wow. working. And we'd already done the demo, right? Which I co-wrote on Master of Disaster, which was the sixth song. Mm -hmm. And some people compare that to Wild Child because the verses are very identical okay. in the arrangement. So I get I get canned. And he goes, and you have to surrender all your copies of the band pictures. Why? I didn't sign anything. He disclaimed. I didn't know like that. He goes, they're my it's my band. I paid for the pictures. They're my pictures. It's my band. You give me back all your pictures. So the world would have never seen those pictures. Had I not grabbed the negatives when he was at home and went up to Sunset Boulevard and made more copies. <laughs> and when I came back, he knew what I did. He yeah. saw that the negatives were gone. This time, I ditched a couple of pictures. And he goes, uh, he went off like a volcano. This guy was yelling and screaming at me like I was a redheaded stepchild. He goes, not your, not your property. You don't allow to have those. Blah, 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 blah. Give me those fucking pictures. And I had to give him what I had in my hand. Yep. Luckily, the pictures that are now out there are the ones that I stashed. And if it wasn't for those and the demo, I wouldn't be able to prove I was in the band. He knew what he was doing. He, he intentionally censored the fact that I was in the band at the very beginning. And now there are hostile Blackie Lawless fans who hate hate me. I don't know what for. And and every time I mentioned I was in Wash, these, these people get like like real hornets. They stir up a nest. They get hostile at me. Well, on that's the why I wanted you on here because I'm not going to. I I love Wash. I'm not going to deny your existence because I'm hoping that Blackie comes around and puts you and those demos on his career encompassing Wasp box set. Would you? Would you be? Would you be open to that happening from your point of view? No, from your lips to God's ears, but I don't think that's going to be a possibility. Mm -hmm. I hate a musicians getting erased from their creativity and their role. Well, look at the damage that happened to Chris Holmes. Yeah. You know, Chris and I, after my wife passed away, Chris Holmes called me from France to give me his condolences. Because he's a cancer survivor. Yep. So he wanted to know my wife's cancer story. And then we talked about Wasp. And he told me how he got screwed over. His name was forged on a lot of the contracts. Yep. Like that, and he and I told him what happened with me before I, he was in the band. And and to this day, Chris validates and Randy Piper. It's on the internet. Randy Piper did an interview with uh, Full and Bloom. He said, "So was Rick really in the band?" He goes, "Yeah, it was in the band." And he goes, "Did he come up with the name Wasp?" He goes, "Yes, I can't take that away from him." He goes, "Rick came up with the name Wasp." He goes, uh, "Blackie added the periods later." Because Rick was gonna, he was afraid Rick was gonna sue him. Because because he, his, uh, Blackie ripped him off. He took the name. Yep. So. That's that's the story, and it doesn't matter if people want to believe it or not. But I mean, you know, what purpose is it to lie? If you lie, then you have to keep backing up that lie with more lies. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm for transparency, so I tell the truth. Yep. And and Blackie, you know, claims to be, you know, a Christian and like that. Born. What kind of Christian still 
acts like that and maintains that lie. Yeah. You know, he was the one that introduced me to the phrase "the big lie," which was used uh, in, in Soviet Russia. Yep. And when I got when, at one of the books I saw in Blackie's house, when I got he had books on like Nazis and Hitler and uh, uh, um, uh, all of Hitler's henchmen. Right. And they that quote was in the book about the big lie. The bigger the lie, the more outrageous it is. The more people are going to believe it. It'll take on a life of its own. That's exactly what he did by, by censoring me in the band. Well, that's a shame. You've had an incredible career. Your minders going to get you back on track. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get you moving, Rick. Thank you very much for sharing those stories. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity in the future to talk again at some length about some of your other musical projects. There's so much to cover. All right, Rick. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for having me. All right. It's been a pleasure.